We're now, okay, now we're recording. So I'd like to welcome everyone again to this edition of the BPPV seminar series. We have two uh, wonderful talks uh, lined up for us today by Peter Younger from Georgia Tech. Uh, we're starting with a tutorial talk about multicellular, multicellular is different, biophysics and the evolution of multicellularity. So Peter, take it away. All right, thank you, Sonia. And I'd like to thank Sonia and all the organizers for inviting me. Um, just to let you know a little bit about how the two talks will be structured. I'm starting with a tutorial talk where I really want to focus on what are the open questions about the evolution of multicellularity and also how do how do we think about them as physicists. And then in the research talk, I'll move on to talk about what have we done to try to address many of these open questions. But without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. So the evolution of multicellularity was, of course, transformative for life on Earth, leading to the evolution of many diverse organisms, uh, um, at, like the ones that you see here. And one of the features of multicellular organisms, and one of their reasons for success, is they're able to assemble complex functional structures. Okay, and so through phylogenetic studies biologists have been able to figure out that multicellularity, unlike many other evolutionary, uh, major evolutionary transitions, multicellularity has actually evolved many independent times. Now, the exact number depends how you count them, but it's evolved in at least 25 independent lineages. Now, these transitions also occurred in the deep past, so we can't look at nascent multicellular organisms in uh, um, uh, the world today. And so while phylogenetic studies have uh, taught us a lot about how many times multicellularity evolved and when multicellularity evolved, we still don't completely understand how multicellularity evolves. And this is a problem evolutionary biologists have been interested in for quite some time, of course, but I think is still a little understudied from the biophysics side. And I think part of the reason is there's an attractive straw man argument here, which is that, well, the evolution of multicellularity must be pretty easy once you have cells, right? And certainly it's easier to evolve from having cells to multicellularity than it is to evolve from no cells to having cells. No doubt about that. Uh, but let me say, before I uh, get into why this straw man argument is wrong, let me just say a little bit about why I, I can understand where it comes from. See, if I wanted to, say, build a sculpture like this, it's going to be much easier if I go to my kids' rooms and borrow some Legos, take some pre-made blocks, than if I go to my lab and try to start with molecular polystyrene, right? And this idea isn't, isn't wrong, but it misses a lot of open questions, a lot of complex and rich uh, phenomena that we still don't understand about how you make this leap from unicellularity to multicellularity. And so in this tutorial talk, I want to talk about three sets of problems, uh, with, and with uh, each one will have some individual questions along the way. But first, we'll talk about how the multicellular group emerges as the new kind of individual. Then we'll talk about the evolution of complex morphology. And finally, we'll talk about contingent effects, what aspects of multicellular evolution depend on specifics from the unicellular ancestors. But first, how does the multicellular individual emerge? And in particular, we'll focus on two separate questions. How in simple nascent multicellular organisms, how do new group level traits emerge? And second, how does multicellular heredity arise? So why is this even a problem? Well, if we look at extant multicellular organisms, especially some of the most studied organisms, animals, then what we see is a very complex uh, choreographed dance that occurs during development. Developmental genes are able to control gene expression of cells, both spatially and temporally, as you see uh, in this uh, uh, image here. And by controlling gene expression in space and time, they can impact how embryos grow, how they develop, and thus produce complicated tissues with complicated functions. This process is highly regulated and it's very consistent. And since the control is occurring at the genetic level, mutations to developmental genes can lead to new structures, 
And if those structures are beneficial, then they can, uh, uh, they'll be adaptive. And so again, since it's occurring all at the genetic level, it'll be heritable. Offspring will resemble their multicellular parents. Okay. And a classic example of this is the size and shape of the beaks of Darwin's finches, where it's been shown that mutations in developmental genes are responsible for these different sizes and shapes, which were beneficial on different islands and so on. So for extant multicellular organisms, this is, of course, a very complicated topic. This is what developmental biology is seeking to understand. But if we take a step back and think about nascent multicellular organisms, think about organisms right after they make the leap to multicellular uh, to the multicellular lifestyle, we run into a problem. Because you see, well, on the one hand, development is required for multicellular adaptation, as we just laid out a, a minute ago. On the other hand, development is itself a multicellular adaptation. These multicellular developmental genes aren't directly playing a role in the unicellular ancestors' uh, uh, life. So this, of course, leads to a chicken or egg problem, leading to open questions about, for nascent multicellular organisms, how do new group-level traits emerge, and how can these traits, how, how does heredity arise? How can these traits be heritable from parent to offspring? And so this question of emergence is a classic one in biology because, we, of course, organisms are very hierarchically structured from genes at the bottom moving up through length scales to organisms at the top. And so understanding this hierarchy where structures emerge at higher and higher uh, uh, levels, longer and longer length scales, classic problem in biology. But emergence is, of course, also a classic problem in physics. Philip Anderson, of course, uh, uh, laid a lot of the groundwork for this in the study of condensed matter physics. Um, and uh, of course, uh, I'll point to his classic uh, paper, More is Different. So this is the idea that you can't understand the group by studying the individual in high detail. You can only understand the group by directly studying the group, right? The way that many things interact is different from how, what you would predict from just looking at one individual. And so with multicellular organisms or with nascent multicellular organisms, this is essentially the question. For multicellular groups, how does this how does a multicellular group emerge as the new individual? How does evolution start to proceed at the group level rather than at the level of individual cells? And without going into uh, the research about this, I'll just briefly note that, the hypothesis that has been guiding a lot of our thinking on this is that physics will scaffold the emergence of these group level traits essentially for free. There's underlying physics that's occurring, you know, if you want it or not. And that leads to a class of emergent uh, group level traits um, without any additional biology having to occur. Okay, so that's one set of problems, but now I'd like to uh, uh, talk about the next set, which deals with the evolution of complexity. Here, there's a couple of relevant questions. One is, well, why are some organisms morphologically complex while others aren't? And another related question is, how do multicellular organisms evolve large size? So I think that especially as physicists, when we think about multicellular organisms, we have a tendency uh, maybe as physicists and just as humans, we have a tendency to think about animals and plants. These are multicellular organisms that are very complex, but it turns out that many, in fact, most multicellular lineages are relatively simple. Uh, and in many cases, they resemble simple clumps of cells. And now I'm not just cherry picking images here. If we look at a phylogenetic tree and select all of the multicellular lineages, where now I'm drawing arrows pointing to them, only a small subset have achieved complex morphologies. Okay, the rest are these relatively simple multicellular clumps of cells. This, of course, prompts uh, the question, well, why? Why are some multicellular organisms morphologically complex while others are relatively simple? 
And this is a bigger question than we'll be able to, uh, uh, certainly than I'll be able to answer this morning and a bigger question that will uh, involve uh, research for many years, but we can start to look for some hints at least to try to figure out what's going on. And if you look at uh, complex multicellular organisms, one of the first things that you'll see is there's a size limit. You only get cellular differentiation and patterned organisms if they're something on the order of a millimeter in size. The smallest ones tend to be around half a millimeter, 500 microns. Or another way to think about it is you need to have at least about a thousand cells. Okay, this is true if we look at multicellular organisms on Earth today, or if we look at the uh, fossil record, if we look through microfossils that have been found, the size limit seems to hold pretty well. So we can at least in part move the goalposts of this question, and rather than trying to seek to understand how do complex morphologies evolve, we could first seek to understand, well, how do multicellular organisms evolve large size? And at first, this might not really seem to be a problem. Couldn't we just take a clump of cells, add more, add more, add more, and so on and so on until you have something that's very, very large? And the problem uh, here comes from physics. It actually uh, relates to diffusion, because if you have this very, very large clump of cells, then nutrients are not going to be able to diffuse in to keep all cells well fed and happy. And actually, even worse, waste products, metabolic waste products and toxins are not going to be able to diffuse out. And so cells on the inside will be underfed, they'll be living in waste, and they'll start to die, preventing the organism from just growing bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is a problem that evolutionary biologists have thought a lot about. And there's a, a series of theories out there, which I think are, are, are very compelling, even though you'll see they lead to uh, a, a, a clear open question. A lot of these theories uh, involve a, a series of positive feedbacks. For example, if you have an organism with large size, then that large size creates a capacity um, for uh, signal gradients to, uh, to be present. This could be signal gradients or nutrient gradients. Right, just from that same diffusion uh, uh, limitation that I just uh, mentioned. Now, it's also well known that if you have nutrient and signal gradients, this can lead to differences in gene expression, which could then lead to differentiated cells. These differentiated cells can then achieve division of labor. And if division of labor allows an organism the ability to pull nutrients in and push waste out, then that organism can achieve large size. But once again, we have a chicken or egg problem because large size is now a prerequisite for that complex morphology, but complex morphology is itself a prerequisite for large size. So where do we break into this cycle? What comes first? How do, we, how do multicellular organisms evolve large size? So this is, a, this is a significant open question in the evolution of multicellularity. Um, but now I'd like to focus in on one part of this question, which relates to the division of labor. And so, of course, division of labor is rampant in biology. But if you asked a random person on the street about division of labor, they would probably think about something like a factory, right? Uh, division of labor and the development of factories was essential for the Industrial Revolution. This is, I believe, a picture from an early Ford factory where, of course, Henry Ford figured out that you can make cars faster if everyone did one specific task rather than having everyone build a car on their own and then I guess combine them all at the end of the day. But like I said, this is also very common in multicellular organisms. We have specialized cells in our eyes that allow us to see, specialized cells in our livers that allow us to uh, remove toxins from our blood, specialized cells in our muscles that allow us to move. And so this is I, this is something that because it evolves, we know there must be a fitness benefit, at least in some cases, right? This division of labor must be adaptive at least some of the time. But again, if we go back to this phylogenetic tree, and if we look at all of these multicellular lineages, only some of them achieved complex multi, uh, multicellularity. So division of labor is evidently not always beneficial, just often enough that it's not uncommon. So 
how do evolutionary biologists think about this? Well, um, for this, I'll, I'll turn for, uh, for an example to a multicellular algae, Volvox carteri. And among complex multicellular organisms, this is a relatively simple one um, that exhibits reproductive division of labor. Now, reproductive division of labor or germ soma differentiation is a very common type of uh, division of labor where you separate out cells that are responsible for reproduction and cells that are responsible for keeping an organism alive. For Volvox, they essentially are cells in and on a blob of extracellular matrix, and the cells on the surface are somatic cells. They're flagellated. They allow Volvox to swim uh, towards light sources. And the, these clumps of cells in the middle, these are daughter colonies. These are the, the germline. This is where reproduction is occurring. And these each of these larger clumps in the middle will become a Volvox carteri organism themselves. So the way that biologists often model this process is you can think about somatic cells as per, uh, being responsible for the organism's viability, which we'll term V, the germ cells are responsible for fecundity, for reproduction, which will turn B. And biologists have then said, well, we can simply mo uh, model fitness, W, as the product of V times B. And if you're not quite getting the intuition here, uh, don't, don't worry too much about it. But one way to think about this is viability you could think of as being like lifespan and fecundity you could think of as being like reproductive rate. Right. So first off, that gets rid of your dimensionality, which is always nice. But the other thing is that captures sort of what's going on here. If you live longer, you'll have more opportunities to reproduce. Or, and if you reproduce at a higher rate, you'll reproduce more often if, over the same time period. OK, so where the problem comes in is this is your fitness product of viability and fecundity. But you also have only a finite amount of resources. You can't just max out your viability and your fecundity and do great at everything, right? Any bit of, uh, for example, any bit of ATP that you have, you can put towards swimming towards a light source or towards developing a new daughter colony, but you can't split that, uh, that molecule. You can't use it twice for each of those actions. So the general theory that's been developed says that division of labor will only occur when you have accelerating returns on investment into one task. All right, so this plot is a plot of the fitness return from investment into task A, which could be reproduction or fecundity, versus the proportion of resources invested into, into task A, okay? So as you invest more and more, if you have an accelerating return, if it's concave up, then division of labor will be adaptive. The fitness V times B will be higher. Whereas if you have diminishing returns, if you have this convex function, then instead the generalists will have a higher fitness. Okay, so I don't, I don't want to uh, uh, belabor this too long, but just uh, to make sure that everyone's on the same page, you could think of this as uh, if your your total resources are limited, so v plus b has to be equal to one, but then your return on investment will have will be some power law, right? V to uh, the power law alpha is your fitness return on investing into viability, and B to the uh, raised to the alpha power will be your fitness return on investing in fecundity. Okay, and so then you could have perhaps a if alpha equals one, a linear relationship. If alpha is greater than one, you can have a concave relationship, and if alpha is less than one, you can have a convex relationship. The fitness of the organism would then be. Uh, you could just pick it out, out of your curve, and uh, you could write down your fitness as the product of the returns on your investments in these different um, uh, tasks. Okay, so what is the best investment strategy going to be? Well, this is where biologists then turn to a beautifully simple mathematical result known as Jensen's, in Jensen's inequality, which tells us about if you have a convex or a concave curve, if the average of the endpoints or the curve at the midpoint will be higher. So for a concave curve, it turns out that the average of the endpoints will be larger all the time than the value of the curve in the middle, 
Whereas for a convex curve, the opposite is true. The average of the endpoints is less than the value of the curve in the middle. And so essentially this mathematics ensures that if you have diminishing returns, generalists, the middle of the curve will be favored over specialists, or if you have accelerating returns, then the endpoints of the curve, the specialist uh, condition, will be favored over the generalists. Okay, this, uh, I'm happy to address any questions that anyone might have about this model, but the, I, uh, because of course the devil's in the details, but it's a relatively elegant uh, way of thinking about this that might also seem to be uh, 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 extremely robust. But there is one big problem, which is that there's no empirical evidence for this accelerating fitness as a function of investment in uh, one task or another. This was pointed out in a really wonderful review article that I would encourage anyone interested uh, to, to check out. But of course, these are difficult experiments to do. So the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, but it does present a major problem. All right, finally, I want to discuss contingent effects. How did the details of the ancestors of multicellular organisms come into play? And as one of the uh, uh, questions along the way, I want to start actually by saying, well, how in the world do we study any of this at all? And so, of course, you would love to be able to step back in time uh, or turn to the fossil record and look at the first multicellular organism in a lineage and its offspring and their offspring and so on. But again, they didn't fossilize well, so we aren't able to do that. Um, instead, in collaboration with Will Ratcliffe, we do the next best thing. Will developed a wonderful uh, system, uh, just absolutely brilliant, to actually evolve multicellularity in the lab. And it's wonderfully simple. You take a tube of baker's yeast, grow it all day in a shaker incubator. At the end of the day, take it out of the incubator, put it on the bench top, let it sit for five minutes. Yeast cells are big, they'll settle out of suspension. After five minutes, take 90% of the volume of the tube from the top, throw it out, just keep the stuff at the bottom, resuspend it in fresh media, repeat day after day. After a week, your single celled baker's yeast will actually evolve such that uh, uh, after reproduction is finished, Mother and daughter cells do not separate, but instead remain together. And thus they form this sort of fractal-like multicellular group, which Will named snowflake yeast. Okay, now snowflake yeast is a beautifully tractable system, both physically and biologically. For example, if you have a small cluster, we could actually, just by looking at the structure, figure out which cell was the first one in the cluster. What was the first generation, second generation, third, fourth, and on and on. But you might look at this cluster and these uh, bonds that appear during reproduction and think they're somewhat peculiar. Because one thing, uh, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is these bonds between mother and daughter, these are not sticky. These are chitinous rings that appear during the budding process to keep mother and daughter together until reproduction finishes. Okay, and so they are not reformable. Once they break, that's it. There's no coming back. And again, this might seem somewhat peculiar because at least uh, in biophysics, I'd say the two most commonly studied systems are either animal tissues and biofilms. And in each of those cases, you have sticky reformable bonds. If two cells in an embryo come apart, they can form new bonds or they could even come back together and stick to each other again. Same with bacteria and a biofilm. And this represents one class of multicellular bonds. But these non-reformable bonds essentially represent the other class. We think we can broadly separate nearly all intercellular interactions and in multicellular organisms into one of these two classes. They either are reformable, they can break and reform, or they're non-reformable. These bonds typically form during cell division, and once they break, that's it. They can't come back. So physically, the kind of bond that's present in an organism can have a big impact. It can determine both the, uh, the overall morphology as well as the underlying topology, which cells connect to and interact with which other cells. For reformable uh, bonds, the topology and morphology can dynamically change over time, leading to new interactions. Whereas for these permanent or non-reformable bonds, the topology arises during reproduction and then is fixed 
It can only be changed by adding more cells or by permanently breaking these bonds. And so again, you might think that snowflake yeast with its permanent non-reformable bonds is going to be different from, let's say, most multicellular organisms. But it turns out, at least among complex multicellular organisms, the opposite is true. Animals are actually unique among complex multicellular organisms because all of the other complex multicellular lineages primarily develop with these non-reformable bonds. This is true for plants. This is true for um, fungal fruiting bodies. This is true for your multicellular algaes, cyanobacteria, and on and on. And so it turns out that there's a lot of value to studying these non-reformable bonds. You maybe in that case won't learn as much about animals and the way that animals develop, but you'll learn about uh, almost all of the rest of complex multicellular organisms. And just super briefly, I'll mention that they, uh, uh, permanent bonds or non-reformable bonds present a mechanical challenge because once they're broken, that's it. There's no coming back. And so if you have linear filaments or branch trees, both of which are very common among simple multicellular organisms, if stress builds up to the point that a bond breaks, well, that could either be detrimental to the organism or beneficial. So with that, we've reached uh, the, the end of the tutorial. So hopefully I've convinced you that there are some major open questions in uh, um, in the evolution of uh, multicellularity, and many of them touch on ideas and concepts from physics um, that might be integral. I, I, solving those physical problems might be integral to solving the overall biological problems associated with the evolution of multicellularity. Okay. Thank the speaker so much for a wonderful tutorial talk. Um, that was really, really fascinating. Um, so we're a little bit over time. So let's do maybe one question uh, and then move on to the research talk and then save other questions for after, if that sounds. That sounds great. Everybody. Yeah. There, are a few, there are a few questions in the chat, but I guess let's, let's just look at the, it's the first one. Um, which was from Olivia Leland, um, who was asking when you were talking about uh, the minimal requirements for differentiation. Um, so she was asking, um, do the, is it that the cells need to be larger than 500 microns or the group of cells, I think? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question because of course you can have cells of many different sizes. And that's part of where there's that little bit of wiggle room, order millimeter versus 500 microns. And, but really, I, I might point as much to the thousand cells. That seems to be the, the more important uh, limit rather than the, the physical dimension, the, the number of cells. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. of course, yeah, double the cell size and then, you know, you, you, you've doubled the organism size, but without any real benefit. Yeah. No, thank you for that, that, that question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so, yes, yeah, so there are a few other interesting questions, but I think we should. Uh, go on to the research talk and hopefully everyone can stay and we can, you know, follow up with all of the remaining questions. Um, that sounds great. Yeah. And I'll definitely be sticking around. So if you're, if you're able to, uh, uh, please do. Okay. So 